New York City, April 30th, 1789. To tumultuous cheers, a few simple words echo across America. I, George Washington, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of the president. At Federal Hall, George Washington becomes the first president of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. A new Constitution, a new president, a new nation. But just hundreds of miles away, other nations lay dying. The pain of their people comes from the death grip that crushed them between Great Britain and its American colonies as patriots fought the revolution that won the United States its independence. They are the Haudenosaunee, a name meaning people of the Longhouse, better known as the Iroquois. The nations of the Iroquois Confederacy had been a powerful, influential force in colonial America. Their diplomatic and military skills, their numbers and unity had given them enormous strength. Now that unity was undone, their mighty league lay in tatters. This revolution was about honor you know, and freedom, and dignity, and the rights of man. And here they were just absolutely pushing us off of our lands and, and starving us. George Washington is called the father of his country. The Iroquois had another name for him, Lanadagalas destroyer of towns. Waters of Niagara, New York State. We think of this as the East, but in the early days of the first European colonists, this was part of the Western frontier. To understand how the West was lost, you can begin at places in the East, like Niagara. Hundreds of years before Europeans ever set foot here, the territory that is now New York was a place of unending, extraordinary beauty. Mountains, lakes, rivers, streams, mile after mile of thick forest and wild grass. But it was not a land of peace. The Iroquois people who live here are in turmoil, divided by war, trapped in violent, vicious blood feuds. There was a time when uh, our, our people simply were afraid to look into the next day for fear of what they would see. And there wasn't any hope at that point. It was a time when our men were abusing our women Our women were abusing our children. It was a terrible, terrible period in our history.
According to Iroquois tradition, salvation arrives in the form of a prophet, an Indian man of virgin birth called the Peacemaker. He travels from native settlement to settlement, preaching a gospel of world peace. The Peacemaker brings a message from the Creator. There will be a new world for the Iroquois, a world in which the five nations of the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse, will unite in a league of harmony and security. He did things like he took a, an arrow, one arrow, and he broke it. And when he broke it, it showed the people how easily each of their individual nations could be broken. Then he tied five arrows together and tried to break that bundle, but he couldn't do it. And he said, that's how we'll be. If we unify and we're united as this bundle of five arrows is, then we'll be strong. The Iroquois heed the peacemaker's message and unite in a powerful league dedicated to peace. The five nations of this new Iroquois Confederacy are the Senecas, the Cayugas, the Onondagas, the Oneidas, and the Mohawks. Before leaving, the peacemaker warns the five nations never to return to their former violent ways. If you chiefs by the council fire should be continually throwing ashes at one another, your people will go astray. Their heads will roll. Authority will be gone. Your enemies then may see that your minds are scattered. The League will be at a standstill. And the good news of peace and power will be unable to proceed. Committed to peace, the Iroquois enter an era of prosperity. Men are able to hunt without fear. Women who are treated as esteemed equals in Iroquois society can oversee the growing of sacred corn, beans, and squash. It is a time when the Iroquois live in harmony with each other and their land. In the terminology, that we have with the Haudenosaunee, we call her Itinoha, our mother, because the land gives life. But life for the Haudenosaunee is about to take a dangerous and dramatic turn. July 1609. French explorer Samuel de Champlain and a war party of Huron and Algonquin Indians come down from Canada to raid the Mohawks. It is the Iroquois' first hostile encounter with the whites from across the ocean. From the journals of Samuel de Champlain. I marched on until I was within some 30 yards of the enemy, who, as soon as they caught sight of me, halted and gazed at me, and I at them. When I saw them make a move to draw their bows upon us, I took aim with my arquebus and shot straight at one of the three chiefs. The French just somehow didn't understand that making peace and allies of the Iroquois would have been a better idea. Instead, they, um, they made them as enemies. But of course, this was all over the fur trade. Beaver pelts, prized in Europe for elegant beaver hats, are what the French are after. And they rely on their Huron and Algonquin allies to help get them. In exchange, the Indians receive metal utensils, blankets, and firearms. The Iroquois know that to stay alive, they too must get guns, make alliances, become players in the fur trade. 
they turn to a rival of the French, the Dutch, whose settlements are steadily growing nearby. If they do not get guns from the Dutch, they will be overwhelmed. The only way they can get guns from the Dutch is to participate in the fur trade with the Dutch as partners and to uh, begin to expand into the lands necessary to obtain the beaver pelts for the fur trade. So it becomes like an arms race. The French wrestle with the Iroquois and the Dutch for control of the fur trade. At the same time, Jesuit missionaries arrive among the people of the Five Nations, preaching both for God and country, the country of France. The Jesuit black robes bring more with them than the word of their God. They also bring killers, influenza, and smallpox. They were confused. They were frightened. Um, they, they, were, they were terrified by this thing that they didn't understand. And they, of course, associated the suffering with the arrival of the people from the East. The Iroquois defend themselves against what they believe is Jesuit witchcraft. Missionaries are seized and forced to endure excruciating tortures. The Iroquois declare war on the French and their Indian allies. The Hurons, longtime enemies of the Iroquois and devoted friends of the French, are hammered by the wrath of the Haudenosaunee. By 1650, the Hurons are nearly wiped out. But the Iroquois victory is not without cost. Sickness and warfare have exhausted them as well. The forests are depleted of precious beaver. Life for the Haudenosaunee has forever changed. The great law of peace has been stained with blood. But what I think we are, we are looking for is peace at that point in time. We are looking for an end to these wars that have been taking so much resources, so much human life, and so much of our time. So what you want to do then is to get on the side of initiating. You want to get on the side of initiating treaties that form a peace so that you can begin to get control of your environment again and get control of your life. To regain control, the Iroquois Confederacy looked south along the Hudson River. In 1664, the Dutch surrender their American territory to the British, who rename it New York. Traditional enemies of the French, the English are quick to recognize the advantages of an alliance with the Iroquois. Called the Covenant Chain, this relationship will determine the fate of North America. I think they came to grips with the knowledge that, uh, that they either accommodate this permanent presence or they fight with it, and there was no guarantee that they could win this fight. As a matter of fact, I think they realized they couldn't. As the 17th century comes to a close, the Iroquois Confederacy is able to negotiate a peace with both France and England. Successful for decades, it is a delicate balancing act, but ultimately an impossible one. In 1710, three Mohawk ambassadors and a representative of the Mohican people 
are taken on a fantastic journey, a voyage of diplomacy across the sea to London. They are presented to the royal court of Queen Anne as the kings of the five nations. During their two-week visit, they are given tours of the British capital. They even attend a performance of Shakespeare's Macbeth. The spectacle of these so-called four kings going to England, I think, is, is, is a perfect piece of evidence that the English needed them. The Iroquois world continues to change. In 1713, a sixth nation comes into their confederacy, the Tuscaroras, joining the Mohawks, Oneidas, Onondagas, Cayugas, and Senecas. But as the size of the League expands, even greater is the colonial population explosion. White farms and homes are spreading pell-mell into Indian lands. The Iroquois protest to the British, but it is difficult for the royal government to stifle the land lust of the American settlers. They were perplexed by them. They were astounded by them. My grandmother told me how they viewed the white man coming, they said, was it like a black cloud rolling, a black cloud rolling over the land. And it brought death, brought pestilence, and it brought a great deal of tragedy and grief to our people. Seventeen fifty-four, Britain and France are at war in North America. The French are supported by fighters from the Delaware and Shawnee nations. The English have their Iroquois allies. It is a long, bloody fight. The British call the French and Indian War. Many settlers are killed or taken prisoner. One of them will lead a remarkable life among the Senecas. In 1758, 15-year-old Mary Jemison and her family are captured by a party of French and Shawnees. The others are executed, but Mary is spared. She is brought to the Senecas and adopted by two Seneca women to replace a dead brother. During my adoption, I sat motionless, nearly terrified to death at the appearance and actions of the company, expecting every moment to feel their vengeance and suffer death on the spot. I was, however, happily disappointed when at the close of the ceremony, the company retired and my sisters went about employing every means for my consolation and comfort. The war that has so shaken Mary Jemison's life has also shaken the Iroquois' ability to remain neutral. In frustration, Redhead, an Oneida chief, complains. We don't know what you Christians, French, and English together intend. We are so hemmed in by both that we hardly have a hunting place left. We are so perplexed between both that we hardly know what to say or think. 1763. The French surrender, and Canada becomes part of the British Empire. But the elimination of the French threat only feeds the settlers' hunger for more and more land. Iroquois land. The British issue a proclamation barring white settlement west of the Allegheny Mountains. This greatly angers the colonials. To appease them, the British negotiate a treaty with the Iroquois at Fort Stanwix, New York. In exchange for an Indian white boundary, the Iroquois agreed to cede vast territory in central New York, Pennsylvania, and other lands to the south. 
it still doesn't satisfy the American colonials. March 5th, 1770. British redcoats open fire on a rock-throwing mob, killing five in what Americans are quick to call the Boston Massacre. Give me liberty or give me death. The crisis has been simmering for years, but comes to a head when the British clamp down on American freedoms and try to eradicate the huge debts caused by the French and Indian War. And it was explained to the Iroquois that it was a fight between the father and children. The father was the king of England, and the American colonies were the children. And the Iroquois responded, well, then that's a family quarrel, and there's no need for us to be involved, so we'll stay neutral. But once again, the Iroquois find themselves pulled from both sides in a furious political tug of war. The British and the American patriots vie for their allegiance. Many Oneidas and Tuscaroras have come under the influence of a powerful pro-patriot missionary named Samuel Kirkland. They walk miles to hear his anti-British sermons. He was the one who convinced them the Americans were going to win this land and this war, and if they, they should be on the winning side, and that should be with the Americans. The British also have their powerful advocates. The Mohawk Joseph Brandt is a dynamic defender of the crown. Charismatic, a born leader, well-educated, Brandt speaks fluent English and at least three of the Six Nations languages. To the British, his support is crucial. I think he allied himself with the people who he and everybody else reasonably expected to be the winners in this war, which was the English. Most Iroquois desperately pray that war will not come. The Haudenosaunee are saying, we, we love you both. We, we are friends with the colonies and Britain. That it, it is a quarrel between you and not us. We don't want your war and our country. April 19, 1775. Guns open fire on Lexington Green. The shot heard round the world roars like thunder through the Six Nations. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. July 4th, 1776. America declares its independence. Whatever joy these words give the American patriots cannot be shared by the Iroquois. For them, the revolution will mean only more pain. Their confederacy is being ripped apart. Summer, 1777. The American war for independence rages across the Northeast, dividing families and friends. Reluctantly, the Iroquois have chosen sides. The Oneidas and Tuscaroras will fight for the Americans. But Joseph Brandt has convinced some of the Mohawk and Seneca men to fight for their lands and against the Americans. The peacemaker's prophetic warning is coming true. 
you chiefs by the council fire should be continually throwing ashes at one another. Your people will go astray. Their heads will roll. Authority will be gone. In the fire of Your war, the nations are throwing ashes at one another. They have strayed from the path of peace. August 6th, at Oriskany, in the woods of upstate New York, an American relief column is ambushed by British troops, Senecas, and Mohawks. Fighting alongside the Americans are 60 Oneidas. It was on this ground here that Oneidas shot at their, their relatives, the Senecas and the Mohawks, and the Mohawks and Senecas did likewise, and blood was spilled, and Oneidas were killed, and Mohawks were killed, and Senecas were killed. And then all of a sudden, you're there in the midst of battle, and you realize you've made these commitments to these nations that are not even your nation. And you end up fighting against your own brothers. When we talk about blood, musket balls, you know, a musket ball, you know, about that big. When one of those things hits your flesh, it opens up a huge hole. A man they called Black Snake later on would talk about how the, the, the creek ran red, you know, with blood. From there, it deteriorated from a battle involving muskets to one involving spears and clubs and axes and knives. And they became the most personal, intimate kind of fight you can imagine. Um, people rushing at each other, neighbor fighting neighbor. And a battle continued like that for, for some hours. When the fighting at Oriskany ends, more than 500 lie dead. Some are Oneidas. Many more are Senecas and Mohawks. Dreams that people had, that, that efforts that they had made to, to carry on the idea of the peacemaker was violated here in the most personal way. When you begin to murder and kill other Iroquois people, um, that means that we've surrendered the, the central part of our lives and the central idea of our lives. The, the, the message of the peacemaker was such that we should live in peace and harmony with each other. And here at Oriskany, that idea was breached. Summer, 1778. Joseph Brandt avenges the slaughter at Oriskany. With British support, he leads the Senecas and Mohawks on a bloody campaign against their Oneida cousins and their American allies. And so our people, uh, of course, were, had very strained times, very hungry times and a very, very poor times as a result of our loyalty. And yet, their oral history speaks of how Chief Shenandoah and other Oneidas risked death to feed General George Washington's starving Continental Army during that terrible winter at Valley Forge. Shenandoah and a group of Oneidas walked to Valley Forge with several hundred bushels of corn. Oral tradition goes that if it weren't for this one saving act, that one uh, deed of kindness by Shenandoah and his men that brought the bushels of corn to Valley Forge, that uh, we'd probably be living under British rule. 
1779. Attacks by Joseph Brandt and other pro-British Iroquois are hampering the flow of food and supplies to the Continental Army. And exaggerated reports of Indian massacres have the American public clamoring for action. George Washington decides to go on the offensive. Washington concluded that he could end this problem by destroying Iroquois itself. This was a kind of campaign of destruction that um, he didn't carry out in any other part of, of America. And it seemed to violate, you know, fundamental rules of conventional warfare. Washington takes special aim at the troublesome Senecas. The object would be effectually to chastise and intimidate the hostile nations, to cut off their next year's crops, and do them every other mischief which time and circumstance would permit. The country must not be merely overrun, but destroyed. August 26, 1779. More than 5,000 men and officers under the command of New Hampshire General John Sullivan set out from Tioga, Pennsylvania. There is virtually no resistance to Sullivan's campaign. The American soldiers are astounded by the beauty and bounty of the Seneca homeland. When they arrive in the Seneca country, they find these beautiful homes. They find the finest cornfields. They find the finest orchards of peaches and apples. And what they do is they set fire to everything, anything that can sustain life. They burn it. They kill whomever they find in their path, and they burn the houses to the ground. They cut the corn down. They set fire to all of the corn. They destroy anything that is edible. What Sullivan was doing and was ordered by Washington was to scorch the earth. And its essence, it's saying to, you know, the message being sent to the Haudenosaunee is, we plan to wipe out your families. We will starve you to death. Mary Jamison, the adopted white sister of the Senecas, watches in horror. A part of our corn they burnt and threw the remainder into the river. They burnt our houses, killed what cattle and horses they could find, destroyed our fruit trees, and left nothing but the bare soil and timber. And this is where, to me, must have been the lowest period in our history, where we were reduced to starvation. To think of these proud people who had had 100 acre, 200 acre cornfields and 1,500 fruit trees were now in just the space of, of a month or two of Sullivan were, were destitute. Many of the Senecas flee west to safety near Britain's Fort Niagara. But Sullivan's destruction hasn't annihilated the Senecas and the other Iroquois. His flames only have enraged them even more. They are prepared to fight the Americans forever. But then comes staggering news, October 1781. On a battlefield in Yorktown, Virginia, the British surrender to Washington. 
the English persuade their Iroquoian allies to lay down their arms. The revolution is over, they say. We have lost. To the Iroquois, the world is turned irrevocably upside down. I think they also must have started to realize that they were kind of used and that um, what meant the most to them, they were about to lose. And they didn't know, you know, what their future would hold. It's an emptiness and a pain and, and it's hard to describe, but I'm sure that's how they felt. Joseph Brandt said he felt that he and his people were between two hells. War was one hell. Peace would be another. Seventeen eighty three. For the first time in nearly eight years, there is peace in the lands of the Iroquois. The Treaty of Paris officially ends the revolutionary war between Great Britain and the new United States. In it, there is not a single word on the fate of the Iroquois. No matter which side each of the six nations fought for, it is as if they never existed. And I think that was the cruelest lesson that the Iroquois Confederacy had to learn is that they had been treated as, as simply another political tool. And when their usefulness was up, they were discarded and thrown aside. The war, a thing of the past, the American push westward resumes in reckless earnest. Speculators are selling off land they don't even own. Many of General Sullivan's men plan moves to the western New York territory they had ravaged just a few years before. Essentially, all of those who served saw that land as American land, um, almost as if it was a birthright. They saw their destiny in the, in the West and they would take that up either by right of conquest or through coercion and fraud. And that's exactly what happened. Joseph Brandt and his Mohawk followers are given refuge in British Canada. Most of the other Iroquois are moved to small reservations in New York State. Ironically, it is the Oneidas who sided with the victorious Americans who perhaps fare the worst. New York State takes all but a tiny part of their homeland. The Oneidas occupied an area of six million acres. We now reside on 32. We made uh, great sacrifices for the Americans, and we've ended up with almost virtually nothing. Chief Shenandoah and his people had put their lives on the line for George Washington during their legendary visit to Valley Forge. This was Shenandoah's bitter reward. There was a, a speech just before he died where he said, I'm an aged hemlock. The winds of a hundred years have whistled, whistled through, through my branches. The generation to which I have belonged have run away and left me. It's a very sad way to go. We. Oui the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. In my opinion, it was a lose-lose situation. 
Both powers intended to own the continent. And what the native people thought of that conquest was really not of much consequence. As we look back, we can see that the colonial aims to empire were realized. Today, most Iroquois still believe and follow the non-violent teachings of the peacemaker. So strong is their faith, in 1993, a peace delegation came to share the peacemaker's great law with the United Nations. But some still do not hear his words. In 1990, a protest over disputed lands adjacent to a Mohawk reserve in Canada explodes in violence. The standoff between the Mohawks and the Canadian military lasts 11 tense weeks. To escape such violence, a group of Mohawks is moving back to the lands of their ancestors. They have bought a former county nursing home with 300 acres of land by the Mohawk River in upstate New York. After more than 200 years, these Iroquois people are finally home. Here they will try to make the dream of the peacemaker a reality. Through their eyes, through their words, through their hearts.